Thank you for the introduction. And uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the invitation. I've been enjoying this workshop. And today, I'm going to uh, present our work on understanding a very simple spectral method that turns out to be surprisingly effective for uh, several uh, estimation and learning problems. And this is a joint work with my, uh, with my students. So we know that a central problem in learning estimation is the following. Uh, suppose we have a collection of uh, input or explanatory variables that are n-dimensional vectors. We also have some output response variables that we can consider as uh, scalars. And given a collection of uh, input and output pairs, we want to learn uh, um, functional relationship linking uh, the input to the output. Of course, this is a uh, uh, opposed problem. Typically, we have to assume uh, some structures on underlying function f. And in this talk, we're going to consider a very particular structure of this mapping, uh, where we assume the output y depends on the input a only through its projection onto a low-dimensional subspace. Now here, Kasai 1 to Kasai r uh, is a set of basis vectors spanning a r-dimensional or rank r subspace. And uh, g, this nonlinearity, can be uh, a function that is potentially stochastic. It is either known or unknown. The geometry of this problem is very clear. So instead of trying to learn a function of a generic function of n variables, we only need to learn uh, a low dimension of subspace and potentially and, uh, a function g that depends on a small number of uh, uh, these variables. This is a very simple model, but appears in many problems in learning and estimation. So I'd like to go through several concrete examples. The first example is a rank one case. Uh, this is, of course, known as a generalized linear model or single index model. Uh, and in this case, output y only depends on a projection of the input onto a one-dimensional subspace, Kasai. And uh, the mapping from the scalar product to y is uh, described by a channel or conditional distribution. And uh, there are several instances where this model makes sense. Uh, in learning, this is also known as a, a one-layer perceptron with a general activation function. Now, in this talk, we're going to uh, consider a very special case uh, that, that is uh, uh, how I got interested into this problem. This is known as uh, the so-called phase retrieval problem. If you have not heard about this problem before, it, is a it has a very simple mathematical structure. Uh, we want to estimate a vector Kasai. In applications, Kasai is an underlying image we want to reconstruct. The way we measure Kasai is to multiply Kasai with a known sensing matrix A that comes from our imaging setup. But actual measurements that we can take are equal to the absolute value squared of these uh, scalar products. All right. So what we're missing here uh, is the phase information. That's why this problem is called phase uh, retrieval. And this is clearly a special case of a model because the output Y only depends on the projection of our input, which are rows of A onto a one-dimensional subspace Kasai, all right? And this the linearity is uh, the squared uh, function. And last year, uh, I read uh, an interesting paper that described a, a, a different imaging setup where one measurement can contain information simultaneously about multiple uh, unknown images. And mathematically, this model can be simplified as yi is a linear combination of the phaseless measurements of R images. This is, again, just a rank R a version of the problem that, uh, that uh, we consider. Also, of course, I want to mention that uh, uh, this uh, example of a two-layer perceptron uh, is a special case where, uh, for whatever nonlinear activation function and whatever uh, coefficient you put on the second layer, uh, the output y only depends on the projection of the input onto uh, a number of basis vector psi i. Okay, so this is uh, another example. And I want to mention there are other examples where the model that we consider in this talk uh, appear. So I just briefly mentioned this work. Uh, for example, learning of mixture of classifiers, uh, faceless PCA, and uh, uh, so-called max affine regression. Okay, uh, so this is a very general problem. And by the way, this is also a very well-known model. This is called the multi-index model uh, in statistics. All right. So, so far, I hope I've uh, provided sufficient motivation for, for why it makes sense to study this model, but I also want to mention that uh, it can also have some challenges. Uh, our goal is to uh, learn G, or uh, an underlying substance, Kasai 1 to Kasai R, from uh, a collection of AIs and YIs, okay? First of all, this can be 
uh, in general, a non-convex optimization problem, even if you are given the function g. For example, in the case of phase retrieval, uh, it boils down to solving a uh, fourth order polynomial, and this can be a non-convex problem. And uh, uh, a more challenging case is when you don't know what the underlying function g is, and whatever method that we use, we also ideally want to have some performance guarantees. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to just describe a very simple special method that is uh, fairly effective for solving problems like, uh, like this. And uh, I also guarantee you this is uh, the most, the simplest algorithm that you will ever hear from, uh, you, you will hear in this uh, workshop. So it's very simple. It's a two-step uh, approach. The first, uh, let's consider the rank one case. So yi depends on the scalar product of input onto an unknown vector psi, and g is some unknown nonlinearity. Uh, first step, you form uh, a symmetric matrix, that is a linear combination of ai and ai transpose. Okay, the ais are the input vectors, and this is the outer product, and, and weighted by yi. In the second step, you compute the top eigenvector of d. Okay, this is it. This is the algorithm, and the claim is that uh, the top eigenvector carries information uh, about Kasai. Okay, this is indeed a very simple algorithm because literally it's a one-line uh, MATLAB code. And uh, in general, if you have rank R case, instead of computing only the top eigenvector, what we do is you compute the R1 uh, leading eigenvectors and potentially R2 trailing eigenvectors. There are specific rules for selecting the values of R1 and, uh, and R2. Okay. And I want to mention this is also a very, very old idea. As far as we know, the, this method first appeared in this paper of Lee under the name of Principal Hessian Direction. But it is not very well known uh, outside of statistics literature. But uh, in signal processing, uh, this method was uh, uh, reinvented in the paper uh, by Natropoli and co-authors uh, in the setting of a phase retrieval. But uh, a similar approach has also appeared in problems for uh, matrix uh, completion blind deconvolution and so on, okay. So the question is why does this method work? It's a very, very simple method. Why would the eigenvector contains information about Kasai? Uh, we can consider, uh, explain this uh, by considering a special case of a phase retrieval. In this case, y is just uh, uh, the, the scalar product squared, okay. Uh, it might look a bit uh, weird because the input vectors, AI, contains no information whatsoever about the underlying Kasai. But why would the, the eigenvector D ha has information about Kasai? That's because if you think about AIs as uh, uh, directions pointing out uh, over uni almost uniformly over the sphere, uh, the trick happens here because we're reweighting all these directions. And in particular, the YI measures how much uh, each direction is aligned with underlying the Kasai. Okay, so those uh, directions that are more aligned are given higher weights and vice versa. And because of this, uh, uh, the eigenvector should contain information about Kasai. Okay, this is a very simple deterministic explanation, but uh, you can also consider a more probabilistic explanation that helps if you have a general relationship instead of a squared, you have a, a just a general channel. In this case, let's consider the case where uh, uh, the sensing vectors or the input vectors are uh, uh, Gaussian vectors, okay? And uh, the matrix D that we form is nothing but a uh, an average of independent and identically distributed random matrices, rank one random matrices. If you have enough of these, uh, these components, meaning if M is large enough, then you should have a version of uh, law of large numbers, then this random matrix should be close to its expectation, which you can compute. In uh, Lee's uh, original work, he used uh, uh, Stein's lemma to compute this expectation, but uh, if you use a trick of rotational invariance of Gaussian ensemble, it's a very simple derivation. You can show that in the case of, uh, of a phase retrieval, the expectation is nothing but identity plus a rank one component. And this, uh, uh, this factor two gives us the, the gap, the eigenvalue gap between the leading eigenvector, uh, uh, which is the side true vector, and uh, the bulk. All right. Okay. And a similar idea appears, uh, also holds for the rank R case. You can also compute uh, uh, the expectation of this random matrix. You can see that uh, the majority eigenvalues is equal to uh, a constant, but potentially there can be uh, several spikes popping out, carrying information. But if you don't have enough measurement, uh, then this, these eigenvalues, which are supposed to be equal to a common value, will uh, expand to form a bulk. But, uh, but 
in many cases, all, some of these uh, uh, information carrying spikes can still survive this bulk. They will, they will pop out. So that means uh, if you compute eigenvectors, you can detect all these uh, special uh, uh, directions. Okay? All right. So uh, the question is how do we analyze uh, uh, the performance of, uh, of, of this method? In the rank one case, uh, we essentially need to just need to measure the angle between the target here, a vector at the Russian pointing towards the North Pole, and, uh, and estimate. Okay? Ideally, we want the angle theta to be close to uh, zero, and uh, this has been uh, analyzed in uh, uh, a sequence of papers. What they show is that uh, you can make the angle uh, arbitrarily small, then the constant delta with high probability, uh, if you have enough measurements. So here, m is the number of measurements, and n is the direction. So this is the progression of, uh, of, of papers along this line. Initially, uh, what we need is uh, the number of measurement is greater than constant times n times some additional log factor. But this log factor can be removed later on if you do some pre-processing. Okay? So this is uh, 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 what, is, what was known in the literature for the performance of, uh, of uh, this method. And uh, if you uh, care about the proof technique, the proof technique is super simple. So it's just a two-step recipe. Uh, the intuition is always what I described. Uh, this is a random matrix. It should be close to the expectation if you have enough measurements. And the first step is you use a standard matrix concentration inequality to show that if M is large enough, then this random matrix is indeed close to its expectation in a norm, okay, with high probability norm is small. The second step, use uh, the perturbation argument. Yes? Yes. Gaussian. So in this case, Gaussian. But later on, I will show extensions of uh, this assumption, okay? This assumption is not, not, uh, not so important, yeah. But uh, to, to prove things, you, you would ideally start with the Gaussian case. And then use a standard uh, matrix perturbation argument because in this case, expectation D uh, has an eigen gap. Then you can use davis cahan uh, sine theta theorem to show that if the two matrices are closed in norm, then the leading eigenvectors of these two matrices are also aligned. Okay, so these are very, very standard uh, procedure, but it uh, allows you to get these estimates. Uh, although these are very simple uh, techniques, but in, in analyzing this matrix concentration inequality, you get some very useful insight. So here, uh, the, the, the most important insight you can get is the following. Ideally, we want to form uh, this expectation matrix, which is, uh, has, has, has an ideal eigengap of two. But uh, if you apply matrix concentration inequality, you'll find that uh, if, you, if your these measurements, yi's, uh, are unbounded, then it's very hard to control this matrix concentration inequality. Okay? That's why you need to have the additional log factor. But a trick that you can apply is to uh, trim all these measurements. You throw away any measurements that are too large. Effectively, you want to make yi to be bounded. Okay, this is the idea behind this work of, by uh, Yuxin Chen and uh, Emmanuel Candace. And by doing this very simple truncation scheme, they can show that uh, you just need to have linear uh, number of measurements just need to be linearly proportional to the underlying uh, dimension. But since we know this, uh, this trick is effective, uh, effective uh, we might as well consider a more general setup. Instead of using yi as a weight, we can apply a function t of yi. And the t that was proposed in Candace's work was this uh, truncation scheme, but you can also consider in the literature different type of uh, uh, pre-processing schemes. In general, uh, the problem becomes designing a function t okay, of y such that uh, uh, this performance of spectral method is optimized. Okay? The question, uh, unknown question at that time was that uh, uh, what was the optimal form of this uh, nonlinearity. A priori, this can be challenging because uh, you don't want to only assume a functional form and uh, search over parameters. You want to say what is the optimal function of, uh, of t. Okay? And then what is, was also missing uh, some of these private, uh, previous work was uh, this so-called phase transition phenomenon. If you, look, if you plot the performance of uh, this spectral method uh, uh, as a function of the sampling ratio, in this case, uh, m over n is uh, how many more measurements you take per dimension, and the vertical axis is the correlation, you will see that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, this critical threshold below which the correlation is always zero. Afterwards, uh, the performance improves. And what uh, these prior work essentially was pointing out was the behavior of this curve uh, 
down here. Okay? If you have a lot of measurements, then the correlation is close to one, but uh, they, what they cannot explain is the phase transition phenomenon. And this, yes? I think this, uh, this, this function in this case is truncation, but the phenomenon is generic for majority, of, uh, for, I think for most T, yes. Uh, that's true. If, if your function is linear, there's no eigengap. Even if m over n is infinity, you can compute this expectation. In general, if the function is an odd function, this doesn't work. But in that case, there is a much, much simpler version of uh, in, uh, this method. You don't, do, you don't form the matrix. You just multiply your out of y with uh, a transpose. And then you'll see that there are correlation. So it's a much simpler version. Okay. What do you mean by crit critical? Oh, okay, so how, how fast this uh, approaches to one if, if alpha is going to infinity, right? Oh, I, yeah, no, okay. It's an interesting question, but no, yeah. But it's possible to, yeah, okay, I, I'll come back to this, this point, okay. Um, so what, what we did uh, uh, a couple of years ago was uh, to have a precise asymptotic analysis. So the setting that we consider is, uh, first is everything is ID Gaussian, and uh, the number of measurements over the dimension is fixed, but the dimension goes to infinity. What we show is the angle between uh, the eigenvector and the true underlying subspace or, or uh, Ksi uh, is going to converge to a constant that depends only on alpha. And there is also this phase transition phenomenon. Uh, uh, below a threshold, the angle is pi over two, so they are not correlated. Afterwards, uh, they become a, uh, an angle that, uh, that is less than pi over two. Okay, all these are uh, 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 constructive uh, uh, predictions, so there are formulas for computing all these thresholds and uh, limiting uh, values. And, uh, and uh, initially, when we derived this result, we had a technical assumption that uh, the measurements model are non-negative, but this assumption was later removed. The same prediction works if you have, even if you have non-negative uh, uh, measurements. Okay, so uh, this is a, a picture uh, that shows this phase transition phenomenon. Uh, uh, this north pole is the direction that we want to recover, and what we show is if you don't have enough measurements, then the eigenvector, uh, the angle between the eigenvector and the uh, true vector is going to be pi over two. That means uh, the eigenvector is going to live on the equator. In this case, uh, this method is no better than a random guess, if, because if you take a uniform, uh, if a point a uniform random on a sphere, then with high probability, that point is also going to be orthogonal to Kassai. So this is a, a trivial case. And uh, to make things worse, in this phase, uh, if you look at the, the gap between the leading and the second eigenvalue of your matrix, they also converge into zero. So uh, uh, if you run your algorithm, you will see it's very, very slow convergence. But once you cross the threshold, then things get uh, getting better. The angle is going to converge to something out of uh, this equator. And there is also a non-trivial uh, eigengap. Okay, so for experts here, this of course uh, looks very similar to uh, 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 classical models of uh, spike uh, matrix, for example, the uh, BBP phase transition, and so on. It's, there is indeed a, a strong relationship, but uh, but, uh, but there is a uh, uh, but there is a, uh, it's, it's not exactly the, the same case, but there is a way to to map this problem to a model similar to the BBP type of phase transition. Okay, all right. Some experiment, so we can see that uh, indeed these predictions work uh, fairly well, even if, if uh, the dimension of your underlying signal is pretty small. It's a 64 by 64 image, uh, and but uh, asymptotic predictions in this case, given by the lines, matches with uh, the theoretical uh, with the experimental results. Okay, and this extension, this type of uh, uh, characterization, can also be generalized to the rank R case. So in this case, instead of studying uh, the scalar product between eigenvector and uh, one direction, we need to study uh, the cross correlation matrix between R eigenvectors and R directions. And there's a similar story, but uh, a little bit more complicated. You can show that uh, this correlation matrix, it's R by R matrix, is going to converge to a deterministic number. Uh, and uh, these numbers can be computed by solving all nonlinear fixed point equations. Okay, so these are. Uh, some additional extensions to the rank R case. And some experiment, uh, in this case, we consider 
so-called multiplex imaging model, where the YI, the measurements, is a linear combination of, uh, of uh, three phases measurements. And what I show here are the correlation between uh, the true images, or true directions, Kasai 1 to Kasai 3, and uh, estimated eigenvectors, okay? And theory versus simulations, we can see that uh, uh, they uh, have a good match, and they're also generic phase transition phenomena. And uh, uh, for different images, the phase transition points are different. It has to do with the fact that they are weighted differently. Okay, so the first image, Kasai 1, uh, first pops out because the signal to noise ratio for this image is uh, uh, the highest. And a similar experiment can be done for this two layer neural network. Okay, suppose this is a, neural net, uh, this is a two layer perceptron and you want to estimate uh, all these uh, weight vectors in the first layer and you can use a spectral method, you can uh, see that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the correlation that you would get. Okay, all right. Now I want to come back to uh, the point of the problem of uh, optimal design, okay? So since now we have a, a precise asymptotic characterization, we can start to ask the question, what is optimal pre-processing function T that we should apply? And this can be formulated as an optimization problem where rho is the correlation between the eigenvector and the two direction Ksi. This of course depends on two quantities. The first quantity is alpha the sampling ratio. The second quantity is the function that, that you apply, okay? So we want to search over a function that can maximize the correlation, okay? Now the first result uh, uh, answering uh, this type of question, uh, partially answering this kind of question was given in this paper by Mondali and Montanari. What they showed is that uh, uh, there is a critical threshold of alpha, so-called uh, alpha weak, below that, no matter how you choose this pre-processing function t, the optimal correlation is always zero, okay? This is, uh, that means you cannot do anything if the sampling ratio is below that threshold. But after that threshold, what they show is that uh, uh, this value is positive. What they, what they did was actually a constructive way of uh, doing this. They, they designed a t such that uh, when alpha is greater than this threshold, uh, this, uh, uh, this value is positive. But what they didn't know was that if their design was optimal or not. It turned out to be not optimal. But, uh, and by the way, if in the case of phase, noiseless phase retrieval, this threshold value is equal to 1 over 2. All right. And uh, what we did was to actually solve this optimization problem. It turns out that uh, uh, this problem uh, has a closed form formula. It's a, it's a functional optimization, but uh, it has a very nice uh, geometrical uh, interpretation uh, in terms of finding a minimum norm solution in a fine space, but in any case, the optimal functional form has, uh, uh, has, this, uh, has this formula. It only depends on the conditional distribution, the channel, and the expectation is taken over a Gaussian random variable, okay? And uh, what is uh, a little bit surprising is the fact that this optimal function T does not depend on the sampling ratio alpha. That means for any sampling ratio alpha, you should always use this T, okay? This is the optimal function that you can use within the framework of spectral method, okay? All right, and uh, some experiment, uh, some just example uh, to show uh, the potential benefit of using this optimal T. So uh, in this case, the model is that uh, the activation function is a Poisson uh, channel of uh, the quadratic measurements, and using the formula, you can compute the optimal T is of this form, okay? The point I, is uh, you don't need to uh, focus on this exact form, point I want to make is that uh, this is not something you can guess by intuition, okay? You have to know the optimal formula to know this is the function that uh, you should apply. And some experiment, uh, you can see that uh, the blue curve is what you would get by using this optimal function. And this is uh, much better than a previous des design, so-called the trimming scheme. This is the thresholding scheme that was uh, 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 efficient but ad hoc. It is also better than the scheme uh, proposed in Mondelian and Montanari, uh, the two curves achieve the same threshold, but after the threshold, uh, this optimal curve is a little bit better than uh, what they get, okay? All right, and uh, this same type of optimal design can be applied to the multi-rank case. Uh, if you uh, look at uh, improvement here from green to blue, the difference is that the green curve uses uh, an ad hoc design of this, this T function, and the blue curve is uh, 
what we will get if you optimize the t function. There is a, a dramatic improvement. And uh, what is interesting is that what, what we find in the rank R case, uh, the optimal t for different eigenvectors must be different. Okay, so you have to use different optimal, different form of uh, t function for different dimensions of uh, the subspace. All right, okay. So uh, I want to also spend some time uh, to uh, address the question about the assumption of the sensing vector. So the sensing vector uh, so far uh, are ID Gaussian vectors. And uh, um, I'm a signal processor. So uh, if I talk to uh, my colleagues who do the actual measurement, they will laugh at you because uh, uh, nothing is ID Gaussian. So here, the model that uh, we assume is that the sensing vectors, uh, sensing matrix have ID uh, Gaussian random variables, All right? Okay, and uh, uh, in the case of phase retrieval, the yi is equal to the scalar product squared. Okay, it's a very nice assumption uh, uh, in theory for theoreticians, but uh, it has nothing to do with uh, with practice. Okay, so here I want to mention uh, just a one uh, uh, setup that is closer to what is done in practice. So this is so-called uh, coded diffraction uh, measurement. Uh, what happens is that uh, you have your uh, image, this is Kasai. An image of this, uh, this sample is your vector Kasai that you want to reconstruct. And uh, in the setup, you first uh, place a mask in front of this uh, sample, followed by an imaging setup. And uh, the physics of this imaging setup will give you uh, the following model. Your measurement turns out to be equal to the Fourier transform of the mask multiplied with your underlying image, okay? And the Fourier transform comes from the optim, uh, Fourier optics. And then, because you only can take the intensity of this light information, so you take, uh, you're losing the phase information, okay? So this is the actual setup that uh, is close to practice. And uh, uh, this W is a pattern that, that you can place in front of a sample. You can do the experiment multiple times by changing uh, the pattern, okay? But mathematically, we can still abstract the model. So here, the sensing matrix A, this is the matrix A, can be written in a block form, where each block has a particular structure. It is, each block is equal to a DFT matrix times a diagonal matrix whose diagonal elements are correspond to the patterns that you put. You can assume these are pseudo-random patterns, plus or minus one, plus or minus i, okay? So this is uh, the structure of the sensing matrix that uh, we can consider. Of course, this is uh, uh, much more challenging than the ID Gaussian assumption. And uh, there is indeed some analysis of, uh, of, of performance, performance spectral method if you use this type of sensing matrix. And uh, uh, the estimate is that uh, a sufficient condition shown in this paper is that uh, the number of measurement must be greater than a constant times n times log n to the power of four. Okay, so uh, if you are a theoretician, then you, you, will f you find this uh, okay because it's just additional poly log factor. But, uh, uh, but if you're a practitioner, if you do some calculation, uh, n, that's the number of uh, dimension of your image, for example, one megapixel image, log n to the power four, in this case, is greater than 36,000. Okay, so this is a very, very pessimistic estimate. Okay, of course, this is a sufficient condition, but you cannot use this sufficient condition as a guideline in practice because that would require that many, multiple, uh, that many measurements, okay? You don't want that. But experimentally, things are much better. So here we plot the same uh, performance curve as uh, uh, of the correlation versus uh, the number of measurements, m over n. You can see that uh, for this uh, coded diffraction pattern simulations, uh, they still get similar performance. That means uh, if you have uh, six times as many measurements as the dimension, the correlation is already close to uh, 0 0.75, okay? So you don't really need 36,000 uh, factor oversampling, okay? But uh, uh, the problem is that uh, these, uh, po the performance in this case is different from what we can predict, predict using the Gaussian uh, assumption, okay? So there is a little bit difference. And uh, what we do is uh, to exploit uh, the universality phenomenon, so in this case, uh, as in many other cases, you can show, you know, you can observe, okay, that uh, uh, there is a strong universality in the behavior of these uh, high-dimensional inference algorithms. So what we showed here are the, are the performance curve uh, 
when we change the sensing ensemble to, from the coded diffraction to a random frame, in this case, just a random matrix with, with uh, orthogonal columns. And uh, another case, uh, 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 that's unitary. Another case, a random frame, you start with a dense unitary matrix and you randomly subsample the columns. You can see that empirically, all these ensembles will give you the same uh, performance. All right. So of course, this is a similar observation um, is well known. So it has been observed, for example, in compressed sensing and uh, many other uh, problems. But this observation allows us to study the CDP, the coded diffraction pattern, by studying the unitary ensemble, which is something that is closer to Gaussian. And what, what, and what, we, can, what we can get is a similar type of prediction. In this case, uh, uh, we can show, we can calculate uh, that uh, the angle is all still going to converge to deterministic quantities. And in this case, these quantities should be based on the R transform of some probability measure. Okay, this is something that uh, you can do uh, by analyzing this, uh, this random matrix. Okay, and, uh, and some step in the derivation for experts is, is just uh, some calculation of uh, HCIZ uh, integral. And here we have some simulation results. In this case, the image, uh, Kasai is just a real image. And then uh, the blue curve is what can be predicted using theory. And uh, all these crosses, stars, and, and circles are the experimental results using the coded diffraction pattern, the unitary ensemble, and random frame. They all follow the same uh, curve. And initially, we derived this result uh, using replica method, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, uh, this prediction was uh, rigorously established in the paper uh, using free probability calculations. Okay. All right. So just as a summary, and uh, uh, in this talk, I describe a very simple spectral method uh, for estimating a low rank subspace from nonlinear measurements. Uh, this algorithm itself is very old. It's a very old idea. It's a, known as a principal Hessian direction. But the way we studied it was new in the sense that we studied high dimensional limit. Typically, in, in the statistical literature, uh, what people study is the case when m, uh, the number of measurements, is much, much larger than the dimension n. But if you consider the region where m and n are, co are, are comparable, then there are phase transition phenomena that you can predict. And from this exact uh, characterization, you can also design the optimal shrinkage or pre-processing function. Okay. And I want to mention that there is uh, uh, much more to what I presented today. Uh, a, a, a minor open problem, okay, or a mystery, was that uh, if you design the optimal pre-processing function, function, it turns out that the pre-processing function is always the same form, no matter what matrix en ensemble that you use. Okay. You can have a, a Gaussian ensemble, unitary ensemble, or general ensemble with an arbitrary uh, distribution of singular values. You should always use the same pre-processing function that is optimal. And uh, it turns out that uh, there is, might be some explanation, and hopefully in a couple of months, either I or the collaborators, Antoine, Florian, Lenka, will be able to explain uh, a deeper reason why this is the case. Okay, so uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>